Can you say amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Aleka. We'd like to welcome you this morning to the Pompano Beach Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'm Pastor Steve Verse. We'd want to welcome those who have come today. We're glad you're here. Amen. amen. And we're also thankful for those who are watching online. And uh, we're so glad that you've chosen to join us by the airwaves. And also, we'd like to welcome Pastor Nugent here today, our Associate Youth Director. Brother, glad you're here. Isn't it good to love the Lord? Amen. Amen. Our message today is Promises Made, Promises Kept, Part 2. The Bible helps us to understand who God is, and God also helps us through the scripture to discover who we are. Amen. And so today we're going to do a little review and then we're going to move into part two concerning God's promises. But before we do, let's take a moment and bow our heads together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you for your promises. We want to thank you that your promises are true, that they never fail. And Lord, even though we fail, you promise to help us, to help us to grow and to learn and to develop and to become new people through your grace. So Lord, bless us as we open your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. By means of review, we looked at four different types of promises. And we also looked at the types of promise, promises there are. See, a promise may be absolute or conditional, lawful or unlawful, expressed or implied. There are absolute promises. There are conditional promises. There are unlawful or lawful promises. There are expressed promises. And then finally, there's implied promises. All these different types of promises are found in the scripture. And we must understand by the context what type of promises God is sharing with us. Now, we talked about last time we were together that some people misapply God's promises. They sometimes give absolute promises when the promises were conditional. And we talked about the children of Israel, how that they had a probationary period, the 70-week prophecy, and how that in Matthew chapter 23 and following that they had lost their special status because the promises were conditional. He says, if you obey, you will eat of the good of the land. And then finally, with the war of the Pharisees, he says, your house is left unto you desolate. So we must understand that when we apply the promises of God, that we must, by the context, and the analogy of Scripture, understand that different promises have different meanings and fulfillments. Amen? Now, there were four major promises which we looked at last time, and I just want to uh, summarize them for those who were not here. First of all, there's the promise of salvation that was given through the Messiah, then there's the promise of the Spirit that was and is given to the heirs of salvation. Then there's the promise of his coming. And then lastly, there's the promise of divine justice or the judgment on sin. And so we said that these are not the only promises, but these are the major promises that we find in Scripture that were fulfilled by the promise of God. Amen? God's promises never fail. 
Now, does God's promises have commitment? We saw in Hebrews 6.13, the Bible says, For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. So God is immutable. And Dwight L. Moody puts it this way. He says, What is Scripture but the account of a faithful God dealing with unfaithful men? Are men unfaithful today? Certainly. But nevertheless, God gives his promises to us to help us to become more like him. Hebrews 6, 13 to 18. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, amen, we might have strong consolation who fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. See, the book of Hebrews promises that God will keep his promises. And I'm thankful for that because so many people do not keep their promises. The major promise one, salvation, and this is given through the Messiah. We see that the cross is the ladder or the, or the step across the abyss of sin. The Messiah paid for our sins. The Bible puts it this way, John 3, 16. Let's say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not what? Perish but have everlasting life. That's the promise of everlasting life that was given through the Messiah. Thank God for the Messiah. Acts 4.12 puts it this way, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other in the name of the heaven given among whereby we must be saved. Amen. The name of Jesus, Jesus Christ, paid for our sin. And then we went on to major promise too, the promise of the Spirit. God promised to us his Spirit. And we also looked that we need to beware of counterfeits. As we saw, Dresden James puts it this way. He says, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. And we see today that a lot of lies have been perpetrated upon the world concerning the spirit. And we looked at 1 Kings 19, 11 through 13 with the experience of Elijah. And we saw that Elijah stood outside and God caused a strong wind. And God caused an earthquake and God sent down fire or lightning from heaven. See, God was not in any of those things. He used those spectacular and fearsome things, but Elijah was not to confuse the spectacular things that God does and can do, amen? Instead, God speaks to Elijah in a still, small voice. And we talked about some of the counterfeits we see today, how that Elijah stood on Mount Carmel and he saw all the spiritualistic manifestations of their spirit, and that type of spirit is in the world today. And many churches are practicing these things. But the Bible says it's a still, small voice. God speaks to us in our private time. God speaks to us in our experience. And God speaks to us when we are still. Psalms 46, 10. Be still and know that I am God. And so the work of God, the work of the Spirit, is a work that Jesus described for us. John 16, verses 7 and 8 says this, But I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come to you, the Paracleton, or the Paracletos, to stand beside the Helper. 
And then in verse 8, he says, when he has come, what will the Spirit do? He will reprove the world of sin. That's the number one operation of the Holy Spirit is to convict us of sin so that God can save us. Amen? And of righteousness and of judgment. So God will convict us of what's wrong. He will teach us what's right. And he shares with us the results of disobedience. See, we don't want to talk about judgment today. We don't want to talk about confessing and repenting of our sins, but it's part of the work of the Spirit. Amen? See, because if God doesn't clean us up, we're lost. See, it does no good for God to forgive us if he cannot cleanse us. And we cannot be cleansed until we repent, confess, and forsake our sin. Amen? The Bible continues, John 16, 13, and 14, Howbeit when he has come, the spirit of truth will what? Will guide us into what? All truth. So the, the, the Bible and the spirit of God tells us the truth. Now sometimes we don't like the truth, but God shares it with us anyway. And he goes on, but whatsoever he hears, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Verse 14, it says, and he shall glorify me. The Spirit of God will glorify Jesus, not himself. And so these counterfeits try to deceive the people of God. So in summary, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf. It reveals to God, to us God and his plans. It gives insight into the future things. It convicts us of sin, announces God's judgment, and brings glory to Jesus. Amen. So the Holy Spirit will help us to become the people that God wants us to be. Amen. Now the, the major promise three is the second coming of Christ. And the Bible is replete with examples of this. One in every 24 verses is on the topic of the second coming of Jesus. Jesus put it this way, John 14, 1 to 3. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to what? Prepare a place for you. Are you waiting for that place? Are you thinking about that place? My wife, she even describes her place. She's designed it. She sat at the table and she knows what's going to be in her place. Are we preparing ourselves for the place that Jesus is preparing for us? I hope so. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? Come again. He's promised he will come again. Amen. Amen. And receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. This is the promise of God. And then major promise for it's the judgment for sin. The world will receive the judgment for sin. And as we pointed out, judgment is a two-edged sword. Amen. One is that when God comes to judge, the oppressed will be justified. Amen? God is going to deal with the sin problem. And then secondly, those who persistently, consistently refuse to follow the Savior will receive the retribution of God. 2 Peter 2.9 puts it this way. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation. Amen? And to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And so the Bible helps us to understand that God is good. And also God has a way out of the judgment. Amen. He says there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Are you in Christ today? I hope so. He puts it this way, Acts 17, 30. But now he commands all people everywhere. To repent. And so the message of God today is that we should repent of our sins. And he gives that grace, Acts 17:30, and the times of this ignorance, when we didn't know better, 
when we were weak, when we lived in the world, when we lived for ourselves, he's going to forgive us. Amen. God will forgive us. And then that famous verse that I camp on sometimes, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to what? Purify us, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what the Bible says. See, it's really a matter of trust. Do we trust God? See, over 1,000 prophecies have been given, which are mostly already fulfilled. Can we trust him? If 300 prophecies of the Messiah have already been fulfilled, can we trust him? Can we trust one in every 24 verses being about the second coming to be fulfilled? Can we trust him? See, it's really a matter of trust. Do you trust him? See, we are in the hands of God, and God will forgive us. Amen? So his judgment on all things are part of his grace. And so God wants us to understand that his promises are for you. Amen? So now let's go on to part two. Promises kept and promises that were made. Now, we want to ask the question again, does God's promises have power? I want to remind us again, this is 2 Peter 1, verse 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be what? Partakers of the divine nature. Amen? We can be different, having escaped the corruption that is in the world because of lust. And so the Bible promises us that we can be changed, we can be new people. See, many are asking the question, does God care about us? Let us go to the scripture. The Bible says this, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you. What? Wherever you go. What a God we serve. Again, Isaiah 41, 13 says this, I am the Lord your God who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, do not fear, I will be with you. Amen. See, God has promised to be with us. Jeremiah 29, 11 puts it this way, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. See, God has a future for you. Amen? And all we have to do is to love him. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23 says his mercies or his grace is new every morning. So upon rising, when, the, when we crack our eyes in the morning, God's grace is there for us. God has promised you, and his payment is the cross. His promise was embedded in the pinion, the nails that held him and affixed him to the cross, affixes us to his heart. Amen. See, does God really care? Proverbs 3, verse 6 puts it this way. Seek God's will in all you do, and he will show you the path to take. God promises us that he will help us. Isaiah 41, 10, the Bible says this. Fear not, for I am what? With you. Is God with you today? Amen. God is with me. God is my stronghold. God is my keeper. Isaiah 30, verse 21. Whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. 
So the Bible will help us. The Bible will counsel us. The Bible will reprove us. See, God wants to be a part of our lives. God loves us, amen? With an everlasting love, God is willing to guide us if we will submit to his will. Do you want to do his will today? I do. And the word tells us, see, God wants us to depend on him because we're weak individuals. No matter how strong we think we are, we need God. And when we walk without God, we walk alone. See, is God willing to lead us? Does the Bible reveal this to us? See, the reality is we cannot become what God wants us to be if we remain what we are. God loves you. See, God is willing to lead us. He's willing to lead us in the path that he has chosen for us because he loves us. The Bible says this, Psalms 25, 9 and 10, the meek will he guide in judgment and the meek will he teach his way. See, these conditional promises, if we submit to him, he will lead us. If we want to have our own way, he will let us go. But even in that, he will fight to help us. Psalm 32, verse 8, I will cause thee to act wisely and will direct thee in the way that thou shalt go. I will cause my eye to take counsel concerning you. Isn't that wonderful? God loves you and me enough to give us counsel. When we're wrong, God helps us to understand what is right. Now, does our mistakes disqualify us from God's help? No way. One anonymous author puts it this way. He says, falling down is part of life. Getting back up is living. So do you want to live? And we all make mistakes and we all have done wrong. But God wants us to know that our mistakes does not disqualify us from God's help. See, our greatest glory is not in never failing, but in getting up every time we do. Don't stay down. God has a place for you. Psalm 24, verse 16, for a just man falls seven times and rises up again, but the wicked shall fall by calamity. Again, he promises Psalms 39, verse 19. This is the word of God. These are the promises of God. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Amen. Everything you face, does God deliver you? Yes, he will. Now, he might not deliver you today, but he will deliver you. See, because an eternal kingdom's coming, my friend. And God will lead us in his way. John 16, verse 33, the Bible says this, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. Do we need peace today? Yes, we do. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Can you say amen? amen? Jesus has overcome for you. And all we have to do is to claim and believe his promises. I'm not talking about name it, claim it. I'm not talking about a covering for sin. I'm not talking about presumptuous action. I'm talking about depending on the grace of God. We need God's grace. But what about disobedience? Does disobedience have consequences? One anonymous author puts it this way. He says, disobedience to God always brings consequences. And so what about these consequences? 
Dr. Wydell Moody puts it this way. He's one of my favorite preachers. He says, the Bible will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from the Bible. And so what are we going to choose? The beautiful thing is that God regards our freedom to choose Notice what he says, even in those that sin, he says, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalm 38, excuse me, 34, 18. Are you crushed in spirit? Have you fallen? God will restore. I'd like to this morning turn to a section of scripture it's found in 1 Samuel 15, 13 to 23. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn to that section of Scripture? I want to look at a man that refused to look at God's consequences. I want to look at a man that failed. But we want to also understand that God has victory. 1 Samuel 15 Verses 13 to 23, if you have it in your Bible, say amen. Okay. Verse 13 says this. Then Samuel went to Saul, and Saul said to him, Blessed are you in the Lord. I have performed the commandments of the Lord. Now, some of you may remember this chapter. Saul was told expressly by the prophet when the Amalekites, when they took over their land, they were to kill everything there and destroy everything because this was the divine judgment of God. And the Amalekites were the people that constantly plagued the children of Israel. While they were in the desert, they would prey upon them and they would captured the parties of weak people who had fallen behind. And so God was pronouncing divine judgment. And the army of Israel, because it was a, a, a theocracy, God was using them as an instrument to judge them. And so Saul went and did not obey the Lord. And this is the discourse here. This is the narrative of Samuel confronting Saul in his disobedience. Verse 14, but Samuel said, what is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? Notice Saul's response. And this is a typical response of someone walking in disobedience. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites. Now, notice he didn't say, we brought them, or I brought them. Now, let me ask you, did Saul bring them? Yes, he was the king, and his, his word was law. But notice what he's doing. He defers, and he deflects, and he lies not only to himself, but he lies to the prophet. And Saul said, they have brought them from the Amalekites for the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God and the rest we have utterly destroyed. Notice, notice the pronouns here. They were the ones disobedient, but I was the one that destroyed. See what he's doing? He's lying. He's misrepresenting. He's not taking responsibility for this. Notice in verse 16, it says, Then Samuel said to Saul, Be quiet. This is the prophet talking. And I will tell you what the Lord said to me last night. See, God knew of Saul's disobedience. Amen? Amen. Does God know when we're disobedient? Yes, he does. Now, does, does God want us to confess our disobedience? Now, let me ask you a question. 
God revealed to the prophet Samuel the night before what Saul had done. Why did the prophet go to Saul when he knew what he was going to do? Why? Because God was giving Saul the opportunity to change. Amen? Whenever we're disobedient, God will give us opportunity to change. Amen? And many times he gives us opportunities over and over and over again. Amen? God doesn't just speak to us once. Amen? God loves Saul. And God loves us. And even in, when we're in disobedience, God loves us. Amen. And God's working through all the various means he can to win us back. And then Saul said to him, be gone. I would imagine that Saul was wincing because he knew what was coming. Because he knew the will of the Lord. He knew what he was told. But the prophet is wanting to help Saul. Continuing verse 17. So Samuel said, when you were little in your own eyes, were you not head of the tribes of Israel? And did not the Lord anoint you king over Israel? And you remember how Saul became king. They said, we want to be just like the nations around us. We want to live like them. And then, of course, the Lord told through the prophet Samuel, he said, what these kings will do. They'll take your best men. They'll take your best vineyards. They'll tax you. They'll do all these things. And they said, we don't want you, God. And so, so God and his divine wisdom and his guidance, he allowed them to go through what they did. And Saul was one of the worst kings. See, because they had chosen him. He was head and shoulders. He was beautiful, the Bible says. Head and shoulders above everyone in Israel. He's probably even taller than you, Elder Andrew. And that's what they wanted. And sometimes aren't we like that? We want the things of the world. And God doesn't want to take things away from us because he knows what's best for us. And we can choose not to listen. Continuing. Now the Lord sent you on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Why did you swoop down on the spoil and do evil in the sight of the Lord? See, he's being confronted. Now, let me ask you, if Saul would have repented right now, would have God accepted it? Yes. Even though the prophet was shown, God was giving Saul a chance to repent. God was through the prophet drawing out this wicked king, this king that had pushed aside the promptings of the Holy Spirit again and again, and again. And the Bible says that the, the king Saul was inhabited by demons. 
This man had gone so far and had walked so far away from God, but yet here the prophet is calling this king to repentance. And notice what Saul says. He continues in his lies and his persistent disobedience. And, he, and Saul said to Samuel, but I have obeyed the voice of the Lord. Now let me ask you, did he obey the voice of the Lord? The prophet is right there in his face. The word of God is right there. The mouthpiece of God is there, and he's so self-deceived. See, that's one thing we got to watch about disobedience, folks, because the longer and more persistent we are, the more deceived we become. Notice what he said. I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and gone on the mission on which the Lord sent me and brought back Agag, the king of Amalek. Now, was he supposed to bring the king back? What was he doing here? Here's what he did, and you'll see this all through the Old Testament. Whenever a nation conquered another nation, they always brought the king back to the home. And then the king was marched through the streets. And then the king was hill, killed. And then the king was hung in the public square. See, Saul was just like all the nations around them. He had adopted the customs and the maxims and the, the culture of the people around him. Instead of separating the people of God and saying, God, we're going to do it your way, he said, I'm going to do it just like everybody else because I want to glory like every other king. He goes on, but... The people took of the plunder, sheep and oxen, the best of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to do what? To sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Notice the reasoning here. This man actually deceived himself to the point to where in his, in his disobedience, he thought he was obedient can we do that? I've seen it over and over again. I've seen lifelong church members deceive themselves into thinking when doing wrong, they're doing right. So Samuel said, so the prophet is going to bring this madman, this demon-possessed man, this man that once walked with God and chose to walk away again and again. He says this, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices? Oh, just give a little money. It'd be all right. As in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is what? Better than sacrifice. Amen. So what's what on the scale, what's more important? Obedience or money? What's more important? Obedience or position? What's more important? Obedience or church membership? See, we need God's power in our lives because we are disobedient people. Even Pastor Verse. Ask my wife. She knows. But the reality is, is it is in our disobedience that will cause us to be lost. 
It's our refusal to allow the power of God to come into our lives and change us. Amen? God will give us the power to become the people he wants you to be. Amen? See, God doesn't see us as we are. God sees us as we will be. Amen? I tell you, when my son was born, I held him in my arms. And then, then when I understood how smart he was, I had some dreams for him. And of course, my son eventually had his own dreams. Amen? But see, I saw in my son and my daughter the potential that they have. That's the way God is. God sees you not as you are, but as you can be. Amen? And then we either prove God wrong or we prove him right. By the choices and the way in which we live. Do you live for God today? Are you listening to him? Do you have that time in the morning where that you're talking to him? See, this is the time, that still, small voice. See, the problem is that Saul refused to listen to that still, small voice. And God had to send greater voices. God had to send consequences to him. The armies of the Philistines and others were attacking Israel because he was disobedient. And sometimes God allows things come into our lives when we're disobedient in order to turn us to him. Now, does God want that to happen? No. My father always used to say to me, he said, Steve, you can either go the easy way or the hard way. And being a young man, sometimes I took the hard way. We all know what I'm talking about. But notice what he says. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed than the fat of rams. See, God wants our hearts. And obedience represents our hearts turning to God. Don't let anybody tell you that obedience is legalism. It's a lie. If you obey from the heart, you're not a legalist. Now, if you're obeying in order to be saved, then you might want to examine where you're at. But obedience from the heart is the greatest expression of love that we can give to God. Amen? But he goes on, for rebellion. Boy, do we see rebellion today? Rebellion is as what? The sin of witchcraft. My God. My goodness. Could some of us here in our, in our two-piece suits and our nice dresses here, can some of us be in rebellion and be like witchcraft? This is what the Bible says, as the sin of witchcraft. See, because what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up as an idol. See, witchcraft is the worship of nature. It's idolatry. And so the prophet is helping us to understand that when we're walking in rebellion against God and we know that we should not be, we are worshiping ourselves. Because we're putting our opinion above God's. And stubbornness. Oh, is anybody stubborn here today? Woo! Are we hard-headed sometimes? And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. So when we don't submit to the Lord, we're walking in a very bad place. Notice 
This is the pronouncement. This is the divine pronouncement. After the prophet tried over and over again to say, Saul, repent. Saul, change your ways. Saul, I love you enough to tell you. Then finally, divine pronouncement comes. Because you have rejected the word of the Lord. He has also rejected you from being king. Saul lost everything. Saul lost everything. And then we see in the contrast, David. So if we're walking in disobedience, or we need the reproof of the Lord. How is it achieved? How do we do it? How do we get back to God? Because I've walked in disobedience before, and it's not a pleasurable place to be. George Bush puts it this way. He says, sometimes you just have to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Is that the way we do it? Is it through listening to Christian self-help motivated motivational speakers? Is that how we do it? Is it through denial of our own needs for the needs of others? Some do that, you know. Some fill disobedience with acts of charity. Some people substitute money for obedience. Some people substitute all kinds of things instead of being obedient to the Lord. Is it through our own self-determination? I think our self-determination is what got us in the problem in the first place, amen? But we're talking about getting back because there's redemption for everyone, amen? Amen? Jesus made provision for the whole world. This is another verse I camp on. Notice with me, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. So where do we start? We start with God. We go to God and we're honest with him and we allow him See, we need a change of heart. The Bible puts it this way, Psalms 119, verse 11. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Can you say amen? amen. Again, Psalm 119, 114. This is one of my favorite verses. You are my hiding place and my shield. I hope in your word. See, God's promises is what will take us out of disobedience. Amen? And our submission to him will help us. The Bible puts it this way, Psalm 149, 4. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. That's what God has for you. That's what God has for me, we people who have fallen short. I've fallen short before. And God has promised to love me. Leah Tetzker puts it this way, the one who obeys God's instruction for today will develop a keen awareness of his direction for tomorrow. So if we obey today, we can obey tomorrow, amen? And if we're disobedient today, we can confess. He says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. There's a way out. Russell L. Nelson puts it this way. He says, obedience brings success. 
<laughs> exact obedience brings miracles. So what do we want? Do we want to walk with God and, and face sometimes his counsel? Or do we want to walk in disobedience and be out of step with him? See, God wants you to know that the only safe course to follow is the path of obedience. I'd like to close with a story. His name was David. And David wanted to come to America because of the Great Famine, also known within Ireland as the Great Hunger, or simply the Famine. Outside of Ireland, it's known as the Irish Potato Famine. It was a period of starvation and disease from 1845 to 1852. Over a million people died in the bacteria that caused it was the polyphilia infestus. And it caused a destructive plant disease that destroyed the tupers and the leaves and the roots of the potato plant. The first year it killed over half of the crop. The second three years, it killed three quarters of the crop. And so David had the opportunity to come to America. David worked. He sold his farm. Everything that he had, he sold in order to get his ticket for the trip to America. It would take 36 days on an ocean liner for him to come to America. And David was so poor that the only thing he could afford to bring to eat on the ship was cheese and crackers. And David clutched his bag on the day he was to go, and he walked up the gangplank, and he was on his way to America. But all he had to eat was cheese and crackers. And so David settled into his little hobble because he was not first class, And they put him right by the galley where the, the food was being made. And every meal he could smell the lovely food that was coming from the galley, the smell of the food. And he would sit down in his chair, open his bag, and eat just a little bit of his cheese and crackers. And so day after day, he smelled the smells, and he went back to his cabin to eat his cheese and crackers. One week, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, cheese and crackers. Then he began to think, oh, I am so sick of this cheese and crackers. And then he remembered that he had neighbors who had starved to death in the potato famine. And he would go back and he would eat his cheese and crackers. Three weeks, four weeks. Then he began to think, oh, man, I'm so sick of these cheese and crackers. All I want is just a different meal. 
And then he thought, he said, well, what if I asked the steward? Maybe I could swab the deck or something just to get something different than cheese and crackers. And a couple times he even got close to the door and then he turned away and he said, oh no, they may discipline me because I did not pay for the meal. He went back and had some more of his cheese and crackers. He threw himself on his bed and he said, oh, what am I going to do? Then finally he couldn't take it anymore. He went to the steward and he said, oh, Mr. Stewart, I've been on here, we've got less than a week to go and all I've had is cheese and crackers. And the steward looked at him in a strange manner. And he said, what's your name? He said, my name's David. And he said, David, do you have your ticket? And so David shoved, sh ruffled them to his pockets and then finally he pulled out his ticket. And the steward said, David, would you look on the back side of your ticket? And David looked on the back side of the ticket and it says the recipient of this ticket is entitled to all of the amenities and food and meals during this voyage. This is God's promises. God promises you eternal life. God promises you that he loves you. God promises you he will give you power. God promises you that you can be his. And many of us are going along in life, eating the scraps, living the low life, thinking about the past, hurting one another, when God has all this for you. So what are we going to do today? What's your decision? Are you going to eat the cheese and crackers of the world? Or are we going to feast upon the banquet of God's word? And are we going to trust him that he will do right? And are we going to trust him to save us? He says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. And he's drawn us with loving kindness. And so, I want to ask you a simple question as we pray. Father in heaven, we come to you right now. And Lord, like David, many of us have been feasting on cheese and crackers when you have a banquet for us. Lord, help us to realize what your promises truly mean. And Lord, your promises have been made and your promises have been kept. Now with each head bowed and every eye closed, maybe there's that one that wants to not have the cheese and crackers, but to have your full love and your full counsel and your full word. And maybe there's that one, maybe you've been in rebellion and maybe you've gone a different way and you want to come back. And maybe there's that one that just wants extra help in your life. You need more of the Spirit 
and you asked for him. Would you just slip that hand toward heaven? Amen. The Lord sees those hands. And Lord, you've told us. You said if we confess our sins, you're faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Lord, I claim that promise for me right now. And I pray that promise for each one that's raised their hand or the ones that have raised their hands in their hearts. So, Lord, we thank you. We accept your forgiveness and your cleansing. And we're new people, not because we feel it, not because things have changed, but because you said so. And thank you for your creative word, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.